Hi, I'm Jamie Poisson. So let's start with a very pressing question on this Tuesday morning. What makes a world-class city? Is it hosting the Olympics? Live from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, in the foothills of the majestic Rocky Mountains, welcome to Alberta's Rocky Mountain salute to the 15th Olympic Winter Games. Maybe, maybe, maybe. The Pan Am Games. The 13th Pan American Games have come home to Winnipeg. I guess so. A World Cup game? Well, the FIFA World Cup is coming to Vancouver. BC Place will be home to seven games in 2026. That includes five... Group okay. Matches in June. Or is it a Law & Order franchise? In Toronto's war on crime... I'm Detective Graf. This is Detective Bateman. The worst offenders are pursued by the detectives of the Specialized Criminal Investigations Unit. These are their stories. I know I'm not supposed to have an opinion here, but did Calgary, all you Calgarians out there, did you guys have a crack smoking mayor whose story will be featured on Law & Order Toronto Criminal Intent? I think not. The first episode of this new season, it aired last week. And today I'm talking to Catherine Van Arendonk from Vulture about Law & Order Toronto and the long running series, Wider Impact. Catherine, hey, it's great to have you on Front Burner. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so, uh, before we get into this new Canadian spinoff uh, of Law and Order, let's talk about your relationship to the franchise. Are you a fan? Do you like it? It is a complex question. It is. <laughs> I wish it were a very simple yes or no, but I just think that is not my relationship, or actually, I think a lot of people's relationship with Law and Order. Um, I have been watching Law and Order since uh, I only had access to linear television because streaming did not exist. Um, and I spent a lot of time watching Law and Order marathons and uh, just all over television. <laughs> yeah. And all over television. All yeah. over. Every different flavor. The original one, SVU, Criminal Intent. Like, you know, the, it's... And, and so I... It would be a lie to say that I don't enjoy law and order. I, there is something really powerful about its rhythms, about its, a lot of its cast members, um, about the way it presents a picture of, uh, of policing and the justice system. And, and there is something very rhythmically soothing about it. Um, <laughs> the music. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have to say for transparency, I too have watched my share of Law & Order in my life. I uh, remember spending, you know, large chunks of my time at university just kind of like binging it. I would like drag my laundry over to my aunt's house and crush like 11 episodes oh, yeah. of Law & Order. Uh, although I haven't watched it in a very long time until last night. Uh, when I watched the first uh, Toronto Law and Order spinoff, uh, I know you watched it too. What do you think? Well, so it's interesting. I was a little bit curious about why it is called Law and Order Toronto colon criminal intent and not just <laughs> Law and Order colon Toronto, right? And uh, for people who are not as uh, fully steeped in law and order formats. Yeah, um, this did not even occur to me. Yeah. But there is like there was a law and order criminal intent. It's not on anymore, but it is a slightly tweaked structure from the original mothership law and order. And so that is that is what shape this show is in. It is a slightly different. It does not have that divide of. Um, the first half of it is about police investigation and the second half is about a court case. It is much more about just the police investigation. A lawyer shows up sometimes to be like, hey, I need more evidence. And then they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go back to the case. And that's kind of that's kind of the whole idea. The other thing that's different from a criminal intent format uh, versus a regular one is you sort of know at some point 
who did it, but the police don't necessarily know yet. And so you're watching them put the pieces together. Yeah. Um, so that's the structure here. Uh, yeah. Well, why do you? Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, I know typically one of the biggest challenges with Canadian spinoffs of international franchises is that they operate on smaller budgets. And is it because they're like, well, we can't we can't afford to do the, <laughs> the other side of it. <laughs> we don't want to hire too many lawyer actors. Yeah. I mean, I would be really interested to know what the what the breakdown is. But that certainly would make sense that you have fewer regulars that you need when you don't need a like half of a police station cast and half of a courtroom cast. That's also a lot of sets that you don't have to build and keep standing for a long time because you're going to need a, a district attorney's office and you're going to need a you know courtroom. And um, I think that's that's a little bit of it. I do wonder if one of the other reasons is that it allows you to spend more time with the police officers. Mm -hmm. And part of the success of Law and Order SVU and Criminal Intent when it was on versus the regular structure of the, the original Law and Order um, was your investment in these people's sort of private lives and and their interactions with each other. And it, SVU has done uh, much better in the long term ratings than the other law and orders. And so I, I wonder a little bit if part of the logic of criminal intent is like, let's just really invest in these main characters. Did you like it? I feel like we have a complex here in Canada where we only really like to watch and consume American shows and mm. American media. So, you know, what, what did you like? What did you think? I think it I think it was fine. I think it has room to grow. <laughs> that's 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 very polite. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, it takes shows a long time to gel. This is the other thing. Law and Order was not Law and Order in the first episode. Uh, it is a lot more like a sitcom in that way. It takes time to, for everyone to kind of ease into who they are and what these characters are supposed to be, particularly because they're not given a lot of lines and they're not given a lot of space to really explore who those characters are. And so with more time, I can imagine the chemistry working better. Um, but the rhythms were pretty good. And I will say one thing that it really has going for it is that there is this thing with other international versions of Law and Order. There has been an agreement where they have been required to reuse scripts from mm. the first Law and Order. So Law and Order UK. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups the police who investigate crime, and the Crown prosecutors who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. Those earliest episodes are just adapted versions of American scripts, and it does not work very well. And so it is um, to the credit of, and I think sort of a reason for optimism, that this uh, Canadian version was able to write an original script. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't I did not know that. And I mean, talking about original scripts, uh, this isn't really a question, but but just uh, our listeners might be in interested. So, so this one uh, was kind of loosely based on uh, the Gerald Cotton Quadriga case that, that people might recognize, the, the crypto case. Uh, this is a real mystery that's unfolding this morning, and it all has to do with the death of the CEO in India. Here he is here, uh, Gerald Cotton. He's the founder of Quadriga CX, and along with his death, the problem here is also access to his laptop, and that laptop contains the $250 million, thousands of potential Canadian uh, accounts there, and they all might be gone. Uh, the trailer absolutely looks like it's going to include uh, a Mayor Rob Ford crack I mean, smoking. Have, have to, right? I do not use crack cocaine, nor am I an addict of crack cocaine. Do you smoke crack cocaine? Exactly. Yes, I have some looked at crack cocaine. It would have to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it is very Canadian uh, plot lines and Canadian actors. Um, how do we know how well th some of those spinoffs have done? So you mentioned Law & Order UK. Did, have they done well? Because I would imagine it's, it's no simple task to go up against Law & Order, you know, New York, like to take Law & Order at, out of New York. It's yeah, just, it's yeah. Not. Well, they're not making any more of Law & Order UK, so that's part of the answer there. Um, okay. <laughs> so not incredible, yeah. 
But I don't know. You know, these things are, it seems like they should be very plug and play. And for the most part, you know, police procedurals do a lot better, are a lot more reliable than other kinds of original dramas that that uh, end up flailing on network television. Right. But there is still some X factor that it can be really difficult to plan for or to just, you know, uh, assume will happen. And you, it, there are a lot of police procedurals inside and outside of the Law & Order franchise that you, th- you think would be really great hits and then they don't go anywhere. And then the one that you really hated, I'm looking at you, the American show Bull. Pete Peters, Dr. Jason Bull. Can you help my son? Absolutely. Actually ends up running for like a bazillion seasons and you're like, how, why? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's hard to say. I'm curious, you know, Law & Order generally, how many people are are still watching it like all of network television the ratings are not doing great compared to the historical law and order numbers its high watermark was almost was like 17 million and the current season is about 5 million and actually Hmm. they're very happy about that it is better than it was doing last season and uh, and that you might hear those numbers and be like, wow, that sounds bad. The thing is, compared to how everything else is doing on network television, that's like money in the bank, baby. Like that is a reliable core of people who keep coming back. Um, and it is a safer and more uh, consistent number than most other shows are doing on on network TV right now. So the answer is like, not great, but it's kind of not their fault. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, you know, I know um, the show's uh, creator, or oh, there's so many of them, right? There's mm-hmm. been so many spinoffs. And, and one of the big constants has been Dick Wolf. It's, mm-hmm. it's creator. And what do we know about you know, why he wanted to make this franchise and how big of a factor he is in the franchise's longevity. You know, I'm just trying to think about the some of the reasons why it's been able to withstand the test of time and, and still uh, do pretty well. Yeah. So Dick Wolf, uh, he doesn't do a ton of press. He's not out there talking a lot about, about his wild success. Um there are fun little facts that you can find about him if you dig around a lot. Like, I think there's a rumor I heard that his ringtone is the Law & Order Dun Dun. Um, <laughs> there's also reporting that he has boats with names like the Misdemeanor. Uh, but other than that, you know, he is not a person who is really a, a big public persona. And he has built this huge... Uh, franchise in this huge world. Wolf Films is a big, big, big production. Uh, they don't just make Law and Order. They also make FBI, which has now it's several of its own spinoffs. is a really successful franchise here. I'm Agent Bell, and this is my partner, Agent Zidane. What happened? Single explosion. And he is. Uh, he is still sitting at the top of it. He does not have his hands in a lot of the everyday parts of making the shows, as far as I understand. But he had a story credit on the first episode of this season of Law & Order, which I thought was pretty fascinating. And and so I think there is a lot of what these shows are about and the kinds of ideology that they tend to evince that is a reflection of who Dick Wolf is Mm -hmm. and who his interests are, but you can really only see it in reverse, right? It's not like he's out there saying what his ideology is and then you see it in the shows. It's like you look at the body of the shows and you think, huh, what are the kind of common denominators here? Talk to me more about that, the common denominators or the formula that has spelled some of the show's success at least. Yeah. They are very much in keeping with a long historical line of uh, police and policing shows 
on television that came out of radio. So, you know, some of the earliest shows, the really big successes in those mediums were shows like Dragnet. And that those shows, which were born out of um, actually collaboration with the Los Angeles Police Department, um, are are kind of where we have our modern sense of of policing in a lot of major mainstream entertainment that the police tend to be the central characters in a story. Police reporting is reliable, that police sometimes have to do things that are maybe not entirely within the law, but like when you're in there watching them in the room, like it seems reasonable and you can understand why they did it and they have their best uh, intentions in in mind. Um, and for the most part, it is this sense of a justice system that is that is sometimes flawed, that doesn't always work, but that is uh, full of people who are doing their best, who want good, just outcomes, and who are working as hard as they possibly can to make that happen. It is mm -hmm. an institutionalist idea of of justice. And and you're saying people let people have been drawn to that. They like that. It's very yeah. comforting. I mean, particularly in a world where it feels like a lot of things are unstable. If what you can turn to is the regularity over and over and over again of like a bad, terrible, upsetting thing happened. People cared about it. They tried to understand what happened and they tried to they couldn't fix it, but they at least tried to make the person who did it you know, be punished for that action. Yeah. Like we, there's a part of us that are children and we just want an authority figure, right? Like I, you literally were, could have just been describing a Paw Patrol episode yes. as well. Whenever your art disappears, just yelp for help. Which <laughs> is very funny. And also criticize uh, for being too pro police as well, uh, as is Law and Order, which mm -hmm. is, which is just one thing I wanted to bring up with you before we go because I totally see what you're saying, but also our attitudes have shifted towards the police and the ju justice system over the last uh, three decades. Yeah. Certainly. Right. And um, do, do you think that's influenced the show? Uh, do you think it's influenced the people watching the show? How has Law and Order grappled with that if they even have? They they certainly have. There are all kinds of plots that have been, particularly on SVU, um, but I I see it in the mothership, which after it's returned to the in the last couple of years as well. There are plots that are on those shows that would never have been on Law and Order in 1994. Um, they have the the main character is saying things like, "I'm just not." sure that we're doing the right thing. There are a lot more plots about police corruption, about police bias. I think that I've been so focused on the victims that that my own bias didn't even occur to me. And now? I don't know. How much did that bias affect my choices, affect my decisions? as a cop. But the thing about this is Law and Order is an episodic show, which means that it begins with a problem. You have returning characters, but you're really not invested in them that much in their lives. So they have a problem, they fix it, the episode ends, and then you repeat it the next week. And if you are using that as the structure for a murder uh, where it was like there was a murder and then the murderer was found. That's one thing. If you are trying to use that same structure to deal with something like institutional bias, where, you know, what you're talking about is a Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. case or in the case of SVU, the large backlog of rape kits that have never been tested even if what you're talking about is this thing that is unsolvable in any short-term capacity, the episode is still short-term. You still get an hour of it, and then it ends, and the next week you're back to a murder, right? Yeah. And so yeah. It, it is not built to take on the kinds of big, overarching 
uh, sort of messy questions about the justice system. And so even when it does, even when you'll get this one hour where you're like, oh, wow, maybe maybe there's some massive shift that's happening inside the writer's rooms here. Uh, it'll still end. And then you'll come back next week and it'll be like, <laughs> wow, that CEO, I think he's a bad guy. Let's bring him down. Just one question before we go. Looking back on the influence of the show over time, how much of an impact has a franchise like this had on the way that you think uh, average viewers think about the police and the justice system? This kind of thing is really hard to measure. It's not like we can really go and take polls of, you know, large groups of people and then say, what do you think about the police? <laughs> and then tie that back specifically to any one thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And like, so, well, I do love law and order. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. And my hero is, is Detective uh, Olivia Benson. And that's why I think. Yeah. But it is suggestive. You kind of look at it in a lot of other ways. The ratings of the show, for instance, we may have a lot of shifting ideas about how policing works and its potential biases, but these shows are still doing better than a lot of other kinds of dramas and studios keep making them um, and are not making I mean, believe it or not, there are other kinds of stories you can tell about the world. And and so it is striking how disproportionate this genre still is in, mm -hmm. in television. Um, the other thing that you can point to is, I mean, again, not directly, but there have been a lot of, you know, defund the police was a, a rallying cry for a very short period of time. And yeah. it yeah. now is a toxic thing to say. And so it, although... It's hard to say law and order did any one specific thing. It is so much a part of the ether that you really have to talk about it when you're trying to talk about any other big part of this conversation. All right. I think that's a great place to end. Catherine, thank you for this. Oh, my pleasure. All right, that is all for today. I'm Jamie Poisson. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.